Welcome to Hardware Addicts, a proud member of the Tux Digital Network. Hardware Addicts is the podcast that focuses on the physical components that power our technology world. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the state of the GPU market. It's kind of a mess. There are a lot of changes in the air, and we're going to see which ones might benefit you as the consumer. Then we're going to head to Camera Corner, where Wendy will discuss Nikon fun at the photography show of 2022. So sit back, relax, and plug in, because Hardware Attic starts now. I'm Ryan, your tech guide through the universe, and with me today are my two co-hosts, Wendy, a resident photographer extraordinaire and hardware enthusiast, and Michael, the software sage and hardware padawan. Let's find out what tech adventures everyone has had this week. Michael, you know what? Before you begin to tell us about your tech adventure, okay. if it's something other than a light and some kind of mount, then we're going to upgrade you from Padawan. That's not fair since you know exactly what it's going to be, and it will be a light <laughs> and a mount. Like, oh, darn. That's not at all uh, It fair. didn't work out. Well, we'll try again next time. <laughs> okay, I just can't tell you what it is next time, and then you're just going to have to guess, and maybe I can get past this ridiculous padawan thing or not well in this particular case i have a light and some kind of mount so <laughs> <laughs> so the light is a light that you you can attach to a variety of things it is got a tripod mount a hot shoe mount and a magnetic mount which is pretty cool to do for a camera stuff and then i have another some other camera stuff which is a uh, well actually for your your smartphone camera it's a mount for your tripod, but what's cool is that every time I've seen these kinds of mounts, they all are locked to an orientation, and this mount allows me to uh, easily rotate vertical or horizontal, which means that I can make all the TikTok videos I want to, Ryan. Isn't that amazing? You're pretty much like Wendy at this point. You have now, with that equipment, gotten to her level, you know? I, I would Just say amazing. almost. In fact... I had some issues on a stream a couple days ago where I talked about how I'm going to turn off auto exposure. Are you really? Like, are you finally going to turn off auto? When am I helping you with this? Well, th this is, <laughs> I only asked you to help me with this like a year ago, but I know. we're actually going to do it <laughs> soon. And I do want to get rid of the, uh, the auto exposure because I had a lot of issues where it looked like there was some weird kind of mood lighting thing. So I do mm. want to fix it. This light that I have right now is not a part of that. This is just something I saw that was pretty interesting because it has so many cool features. It's got the regular lights of like warm and cool lighting, but also it's got RGB stuff. But the reason I got this particular light, which is called a Seymour, is it was less than 20 bucks. I think it was like 18 bucks when I got it. And it nice. was just, I just so curious if it was going to be as good as it seemed for so little. And it is quite good. It's very bright. It's very small, though. It's like two inches by two inches. So it's not something that you're going to do for a big array of stuff, but it might be, you know, nice for a fill light. That's what I was getting it for is a fill light. What have you used it for? Yeah, a fill light. Yeah, mostly a fill light and for streaming stuff. So like, I have sometimes where there's a little bit of a shadow on one side of my face because of the lighting that I have. So I wanted to have just a small light that I could give a little bit of more dynamic lighting rather than having just a harsh shadow. And the mount is specifically so I can make TikTok videos as Ryan is so excited to join me in. Yes. That. Once I <laughs> sign up for TikTok, which will be never, ever. <laughs> right. Someday. So I have a story I want to share. I know this will be embarrassing to Michael, but I, I feel like people need to know. It shows off the fact that we've actually learned something from Wendy over these years of doing this show. So I was watching 90 Day Fiance, which Michael's a huge fan of that show. <laughs> and so he got me addicted to the show. That and uh, I started watching it just to see what my friend was up to. And I was like, oh, my gosh. But there was the this one part is where he made me watch it. So continue. But, you know, the person who tells the story first is the truth teller. That's yes. how it works. Yes, but based on the previous experiences of people listening to the show, they probably believe what I'm saying versus what you're saying. I don't know. I feel like I have more cred in the street. But the point of it is Big Ed at one point was 
And I only know that name because Michael told me after I explained the story to him that that guy's name was Big Ed. And so I then, know who you're talking about? I mean, I don't, I don't know, but go ahead. He was take. He's a photographer, and he was taking pictures. And at one point, he said, "Hey, I need to change the ISO because it was dark out." And my wife asked, "What is the ISO?" And I said, "Well, that's the setting you use to let more light in." And she really looked at me at a moment with pride that her husband was not the idiot she thought he was. <laughs> All thanks to Wendy. So thank you, Wendy. You are very welcome. The definition works. I wouldn't say it was spot on, but it works. Close enough. <laughs> good enough, right? It's as good as I'm going to get, <laughs> to be honest. It's as good enough as you need to be when you're explaining what's happening with 90 Day Fiance. <laughs> well, I got to tell people out there, uh, Michael's recommendations on shows are pretty bad. That one's no exception. It's a terrible show. Don't watch it. Is it is an exception considering it's not my suggestion. <laughs> it was yours. So, Wendy, what have you been up to in the hardware world? I'm actually extremely disappointed because I just found out about this piece of hardware and I can get it, but I can't get what goes to it. So I've talked about my robot a lot over the last year. Well, ever since we started robotics last year and I found out about the Spike Prime and then we got our own this spring, I've been messing with it quite a bit, even more so recently And there is a channel that I really like on YouTube where it's focusing on the Spike Prime robot and learning how to code it in Python. All of the code I've written, well, since I basically started writing code, has been in Python. He's a really great resource. And I noticed this other video on his channel, and it was talking about using the wheels and the sensors with a Raspberry Pi. You don't have to buy the hub. You could just have the wheels and sensors, which you can get individually. Of course, I've already got them because I already have that main kit. But you get a Raspberry Pi build hat that, of course, is a hat. It sits on top of the Raspberry Pi. And this was made in conjunction with Lego. So it has official Lego support for the motors and the different sensors The motors and sensors will attach perfectly into that build hat. The best part is that addition is only $25. The downside is Raspberry Pis are nowhere to be found. And if you can find one, they are an absorbent price right now. So I can't even play with this at the moment. But I love this idea. I love this idea too. And can we take a moment to appreciate how smart Lego was to get involved in this Raspberry Pi game because what an amazing use case. I mean, they are so three-dimensional, this company, and how they apply simple plastic blocks into everything that they can. It's brilliant. And also they try to take the concept of those blocks and put them into things that they don't need to be in, such as movies. So why not? (laughs) Yeah. It makes sense that it would go with a Raspberry Pi, considering they're kind of for the same purposes, their educational value purpose. So that makes a lot of sense. And it does make me curious about your chain. You're talking about using the Raspberry Pi for, you know, connecting to the wheels. And I'm, I'm wondering, do the wheels on the bot go round and round? Oh, geez, Michael. Oh, my goodness. Ah, sure, I'm glad we kept him a Padawan. Yeah. That, no that's kidding, what you get. Right? That's yes. what you get for keeping me a Padawan. <laughs> they go... They do go round and round, plus you can get a battery pack for it, so you don't always have to have the Raspberry Pi connected to power. And this is what makes it even more useful. You can program it using the different Raspberry Pi interfaces and then detach it so you could go run it like I'm doing with my Spike Prime robot. It makes it so much more versatile to have this separate battery pack that you can use on the robot as well. As soon as a Raspberry Pi becomes available, that is not crazy in price for the board. I will definitely be getting another board in order to play with this. Because like I said, I've already got the attachments. I've already got the motors. I can build a robot with it using this Raspberry Pi build hat. I wish I would have known about this sooner. But in the array of devices that is Raspberry Pi, I think this is an awesome team up between Raspberry Pi 
and the robotics portion of Lego. I'm not the only one dreaming about hardware. You got to play with a secret PC, Ryan, and I am jealous. I was just finally allowed to talk about it today. I got to release my video today about this. I've had this secret PC for 30 days. I've been exploding to talk about it because I love talking about hardware, but I wasn't allowed to. Oh, poor you. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, poor me with hardware. Well, this is the System76 redesign of their Thelio. I have a new video on my channel that just dropped. The thumbnail is the bomb, by the way. It's so good. System76 reached out to say we had the best thumbnail. And I would just like to say, Michael, in your face, because you say I don't do anything good in the digital art realm. And look what I was able to create and get the respect to System76, who does some amazing digital art themselves. That is fantastic. It was really good on your side that you asked me to make your thumbnail. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but at the point you gave it to me, it was mine. I mean, I didn't do anything. Oh, you're with... saying you're saying possession is nine tenths of the law. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> possession is nine tenths of the law. No, but seriously, thank you, Michael, for creating an amazing thumbnail. Go to my channel, Das Geek, and go check it out yourself. You can see the amazing thumbnail and watch the video there. So System seventy six redesigned the Thelio. And they removed the wood varnish that went all the way across. Now, some people really liked that. Some people didn't like that. I really like the solution they came up with, which is basically a panel that you can remove and put different designs on the front of your case, depending on what your mood is. So you could have a pink panel if you're Jill or Emma or you could have a PCB board version that's sitting on the front of the case and you can take them in and swap them out. And I just thought this was really clever design on top of all the other clever designs that already went into the Thelio. Because in my opinion, it's one of the best looking PC cases on the market. And one of my favorite parts of the video that kind of happened spontaneously was I was out with some friends for dinner and the girls went over to Home Goods. And I was like, you want to go to Best Buy? And then I saw those boring HPs and Dells and everything sitting there. Oh, yeah. And I was like, hold on real quick. And I just shot me walking down the aisle of all the PCs in Best Buy to show. And I put that in my video. What I mean when I say PC is so unbelievably boring and unimaginative with their designs. And so when you see something like Thelio come out from System76, it really grabs your attention because they're actually acting like they care about a PC and the design and what? look of it, which is so rare in the PC <laughs> world, in my opinion. It used to be extremely popular for different companies to stylize their cases. And in watching some of these different computer-related channels, that's one of the things that they will reminisce on, especially when they bring up older cases, was look at the innovation, look at the try, look at the style that they were putting into this case. It's really nice for another company other than Apple to be thinking about the aesthetics of the case while it's sitting on your desk and whatnot. Yeah, and I love System76 just as a company to begin with. I love that we have somebody in the open source community promoting a good-looking, solid beautiful. I, I think the best PC looking PC in the market out there. But here's the thing that made me really like them. In my video, there's some tough critiques that I have that I would like to see them change. One was, of course, the fact that the way they made the back plane on the makes it really impossible. Well, I wouldn't say impossible. It makes it difficult to upgrade the motherboard. Well, everything else you could definitely upgrade and they even supply you screws with a mount inside the case to keep your screws so that you can upgrade and swap out drives and all this stuff. Like they made everything else so easy, but that. But the thing that impressed me the most is after my video review, I got back from System76. We love your review. Great comment on both sides of the fence. So they take feedback really, really well because it would be very easy for me. Because like I said, I, I was tough when it needed to be tough and I was very kind. Uh, about all the other stuff they're doing, but very easy to be like, hey, we sent you this. You should have praised us and told us everything was great. But they've never expected that. Even Michael, when me and you did the keyboard review where we had some critiques, they've always been there to just listen. 
And I don't know, that just means a heck of a lot to me that a company is interested in hearing your opinion and not just wanting that positive reinforcement that what they did was perfect in every way, because really there's no such thing anyways, right? Yeah, I think it's great that they do that. And your video was very good. I mean, there was parts of it I was not expecting. And you mentioned a couple things that I wanted to point out. You're going to Best Buy. The fact that that was accidental and you just happened to be there was uh, like fantastic. Because when you put it in there and you, you say you're talking about the the boring stuff and you're walking down the aisle as you're talking about it. I was like, man, that was, that was effort. That was putting the detail in there. And then the fact that it was just accidental is hilarious. Like that's awesome. <laughs> but yep. the, the other part is that you were talking about the back plate stuff and it, it does seem like that is a good critique, right? Cause I looked at that and like, Oh, that means you can't really change it. But then there's a little note that pops up and says, well, you could Dremel it if you wanted to. And I offered to do it, but they didn't really, you know, take too kindly to that. So <laughs> like that, and that's true. That's fantastic. And that's the truth. I literally reached out to them and said, can I Dremel this? And they're like, please don't. Not this time. <laughs> please so don't. because I wanted to show it could be done if right. you are good with the Dremel, which would be fun. But one of the cool things that I wanted to put some more attention to on there is that they have a chassis controller and a hard drive backplane in the Thelios. And this works for the thermals to have consistent performance. Basically, it uses motherboard data for fan speed, GPU data, and all this OS data to optimize airflow and acoustics and things within the machine. And this is something you're not going to get anywhere else. It's quite amazing that they have spent the time to have this Oshawa certified open source piece of hardware added into the machine to make swapping drives and other things even easier, but also to control the airflow, which when you look at the actual results in a Geekbench that I did, their benchmarks were extremely impressive against machines that were running the exact same CPU, especially in a multi-thread process. So you can see that one of the things that people make a mistake in when they're building their own machines is they just get the parts together and hit power on but the optimizing, finding the right parts to pair together is a big deal because I've seen a lot of people be like, oh, I can just go build that on myself for cheaper. You can, but I'm guessing you're probably not spending as much research as they did optimizing your airflow, making sure all the parts you get are optimum. Because what I tend to see a lot of times when people show me their computer builds is they get a really good processor, a really good GPU, and then they find the cheapest motherboard, cheapest RAM, and cheapest fans and cheapest case right. to kind of go around it and or cheaper hard drives, for instance, or SSDs. And what that does is create bottlenecks in that performance all around. So the cool thing about the Thelio, go check it out if it's something you're interested in, is that you get this pre-built machine that can run Linux or Windows and it's all optimized for you. And it's built in Denver, Colorado, which is really awesome as well. So there's a little bit of a premium for that, but I think that's kind of worth it when you're supporting the open source community and domestic labor. And if you want to learn more about this particular device, you should definitely check out Ryan's video where you can see the awesome thumbnail that I made. There you go. This episode of Hardware Addicts is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Cloud computing can be, let's say, complex, but standing up reliable, affordable cloud infrastructure really doesn't have to be. At DigitalOcean, you can enjoy a comprehensive portfolio of compute, storage, database, and networking products that put your cloud infrastructure in capable hands so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most building world-changing apps that grow your business. DigitalOcean also provides you with predictable pricing, robust product documentation, and services that developers love. For example, I am a big fan of their marketplace. They have the ability to quickly and easily set up droplets on all different types of software, just hundreds and hundreds of options, and it makes it so easy to use. It is just a fantastic piece of the services that DigitalOcean offers. Also, DigitalOcean helps teams regardless of size, whether you have a team of one person or a team of a thousand people. DigitalOcean helps your team grow with their simple, powerful cloud computing services. And as a listener of the Hardware Addicts podcast and a member of the Tux Digital community, you can get started for free. In fact, it's better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 60-day free credit when you go to do.co slash tux2022. That's do.co slash tux2022. So again, go get started with that $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's awesome cloud platform by going to do.co slash tux2022. The GPU market. Oh my gosh. What a freaking 
mess it has become out there. <laughs> I I just had to do a whole kind of topic on this because it's just been absolutely crippled these last what three years now two three years at least with two yeah we're almost three years yeah you've got the crippling supply chain issues you've got scalpers you've got crypto mining and you've got the poor consumers out there who just want a gpu it's the gpu for two years now you've been unable to get one we even got bored talking about them on this show, frankly. It was impossible to really get excited about anything because it was like, oh, yeah, another GPU that nobody will be able to get their hands on. And I think it's nearly pushed a lot of gamers and things completely out of the market. I've seen so many people recently tell me that they game on consoles now. And I really think a lot of it, not that the consoles had didn't have some of these issues as well, but they weren't nearly as bad as the GPU market. I think a lot of people just gave up on their desktop PC, stuck with a laptop, and went and got a gaming console to just play their games on because this has been so bad. What's interesting is the inventory has come back. In fact, it's not only back, but it's completely overstock everywhere, which Wendy and Michael, I'm pretty sure we predicted this was going to happen. Like That seems familiar. Yep. A yep. dozen times. And... People are overburdened with stock to the point that Newegg is now just like trying to create bundles with monitors and other things together to try to get people just to take them. And they even created a new specialty GPU store to try to promote to please take the GPUs from us because they're not leaving our shelves. And they're doing everything they can to try to get rid of the GPUs that they have. eBay is full of miners who are trying to once again get rid of their cards that they use for mining now that proof of stake has replaced your traditional mining and the cryptocurrency value, of course, continues to plummet at the same time. So I've seen posts where people are selling 3080s and other cards and they have stacks of at least 100 cards that are sitting there from their mining rigs or other things. And then I've seen pictures of scalpers <laughs> With brand new cards in the box, hundreds of them stacked up with eBay posts trying to sell those as well and get rid of them because the stock is just overburdened for everybody and everything that was making these GPUs sell like crazy has now collapsed. I don't know if any of you have done any GPU hunting recently, but wanted to get your opinion on all that we're talking about with this market here that we're seeing. I can go ahead and give you some information about what my experience is about hunting GPUs. I spent tons and tons of time going through the documentation, going through the different uh, services and stores to see what all... I'm kidding. I just ask Ryan and I say, you got a, one I can have or you know, you know that kind of thing? And then he's like, yeah, I got one. Perfect. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because honestly, you've been in need of a new GPU for a while. And when I was writing this, I thought, we've got to get Michael out there to go grab one of these because people are selling them at really, really low rates right now to get rid of them. And it's just a perfect time. And you never know what could happen that could disrupt the supply chain again. I really do think this is the right time to go buy a GPU if you've been on the fence. Ah, okay. Well, in that case, I will look into it actually. Yeah, getting a used card is definitely a gamble, and it's one of the reasons why the used market isn't anything I'm interested in. I did get an upgrade from the RX 580 to a Vega 64 not too long ago. Of course, it was a used card, but it was a used card that came through a friend, and so it was one that I was very comfortable putting in my machine, but I haven't been actually looking to buy a new card recently, though you're not the first person I've heard say, right now is the time to buy. I really like Jay. I like a lot of the stuff that he has to say on hardware. And it wasn't too long ago that he's like, hey, we have all of this stock specifically of NVIDIA cards. They are as low as they're going to get. And don't expect NVIDIA to drop a lot of their cards, especially their highest end models, until they get some of this stock out of the way. Yeah, absolutely. And if you go on to justgpu.com, which is Newegg's new GPU only site where they're trying to sell GPUs as fast as they can, you could see the price drops. You have a Radeon RX 6800 XT 
normally 700 i've seen them in stores during the highs in a thousand dollar plus range now selling for 600 bucks you've got another 600 6800 from asus that's normally 949 dollars selling for 599 bucks and that's just pulling up their main page there like the cards have dropped dramatically and this is actually a pretty good site that they set up because one of the things i like is you can pick two cards which they call your fighters and they basically will put their specs in a really easy to read format so you could compare them side by nice. side and decide which one's good for you. So I like that they set this up. So they give you a tale of the tape. There you go. <laughs> a lot of people are speculating that they did this, of course, to try to find another way of moving all of the stock that they have out there, which I think is interesting. But the best advice that you just gave, Wendy, is so critical that do not... I, I really love buying things from eBay. Most of my hardware comes from eBay. My mixers, computer parts, everything. But I would not take the risk of buying a GPU used on eBay right now. No way I would do it at all because there are so many miners who are desperate and they're going to put things on there like lightly used and things like that. And you may get that card and it may be fine right up until you have no return window left and then that thing's going to crash hard because mining just destroys these cards. They're constantly running 24-7 at the highest heat possible and it's just not going to last you. So don't get tempted to get a really good steal on a GPU, in my opinion, used right now unless it's from somebody you know and the prices on new are so good that you might as well just pick one of those up instead. Now, I think that's all interesting, but it's not everything going on. We talked about this on Destination Linux on Sunday, but it fits here as well that EVGA, one of the most trusted and beloved vendors, not only with GPUs, but really anything EVGA produces, has announced they will be no longer making GPUs. They are not going to have the next generation NVIDIA cards out there. And a large part of that, according to rumors, is that NVIDIA is just such a terrible partner. And we've kind of seen this in the Linux world that NVIDIA really hasn't been the greatest partner and even got a middle finger from the founder of Linux himself, which is a very popular meme because of how destructive they've been at times to Linux and other projects out there. But on EVGA's forum, they stated, Hi, everyone. You may have heard some news regarding the next generation products from EVGA. EVGA will not carry the next-gen graphics cards. They will continue, though, to support the existing current generation products and will continue to provide the current generation products. And they're committed to their customers. So if you have a warranty or anything else, they're going to make sure you get that same amazing support. So the rumor is that because NVIDIA is not providing any preview of their upcoming cards to their partners, EVGA and others are basically finding out about these cards at the exact same time that everyone else is. And that's what has really been the cherry on top. And it kind of made me wonder if you guys have an opinion on why does NVIDIA continue to be such a poor partner to everyone out there? What would they possibly benefit from by keeping one of the top selling vendors of all time of their cards in the dark like this. I don't understand why they would do this to a partner, especially EVGA or any of their partners for that matter. And in some of the research and digging that I'd done beforehand, there definitely was some tension before this. And previously, the earlier generations of NVIDIA cards, the vendors would have some flexibility. They'd get to do some tweaking. They'd get to make sure that their cards coming from their company, while yes, it was the NVIDIA whatever card, there was something special coming from them. And a while ago, NVIDIA shut that down. No, there's no longer tweaking. All of the cards are going to quote unquote be the same card. You can't add your bonus tweaks on top of it. And that was a hurt for EVGA already. And then to say, you know what, you're our partner, but we're not telling you anything until the launch day. I can understand in some ways not wanting specific leaks to get out. But if you can't trust the people who are actually putting out your cards, then who can you trust? And I personally, as a company to company 
interaction would take that very much as a hit to our partnership. I would take it as a slap in the face. Like right. the, yeah. the the idea that you have you you're partnering with another company, but you don't trust the company you're partnering with. Like why are they partnering with them? Like it just seems so ridiculous. The only thing I can think of as a reason for why Nvidia doesn't give this information to their own partners is potentially fear. Like they're afraid of becoming irrelevant. When AMD re- released some of their stuff, they released it with like the founder editions and everybody was super excited. And that doesn't really happen with NVIDIA. Most of the time, it's just EVGA. When is the EGVA, EVGA coming out? That's what we care about. We don't care about your custom one. So maybe they were just, I don't know, maybe they're just bothered by the success of EVGA with the NVIDIA cards versus their own cards. It just it just seems the, the only logical explanation is that NVIDIA is either fearful or they're just uh, spiteful. Because I can't see a practical reason in a business sense at all. This applies to a lot of different configurations of what NVIDIA does with the drivers they, they release and the hardware that seemingly... I, I, I don't know. It, it just seems crazy. But I do think that EVGA's stance on this makes complete sense. And hopefully this will make NVIDIA wake up. Probably not, but hopefully. We have a 30,000 foot view of the market now looking at everything that's kind of happening and the fact that there's so much burden with the amount of stock. Everything was ramped up because miners and scalpers and everyone was just buying these things like crazy. Now all of a sudden we're overburdened with stock and you can't get rid of it. And NVIDIA is releasing their next generation of cards but they want to sell the stock of the cards that they already have been producing. Plus, they want to sell all of their founders editions of their new generation of cards as well. And EVGA and any of these other companies, frankly, are kind of in their way, I think is a possible reason for NVIDIA doing this. And so it was kind of keeping them out so that by the time EVGA got to market with the card, they were able to move the stock that they had first. And that's if that was the case, that would be being a really, really horrible partner for a company that has really lifted your brand for years and years and years out there. I do think it's interesting that EVGA also decided not to make any other cards, at least at this point. There could be some contractual reasons for that and things. For instance, I could see EVGA starting to make cards for Intel or AMD very easily, and I think they would be welcomed with open arms to produce more cards for those vendors uh, and basically start to shut NVIDIA out. I think EVGA is on to the fact that the GPU market is in for some rough roads. So maybe they're just taking some time to kind of pause and see what they want to do in the future. And, or maybe there's some contractual obligations there in which they can't switch immediately to one of the other vendors. But Either way, it's very interesting world in the GPU market because it's definitely had these ups and downs. And we've talked about Intel coming in to this game as well. In fact, I just saw a video drop today from one of the big YouTubers that was an all Intel build, including the new Intel GPU. So Intel may be starting to really ramp up uh, to get people's attention there. But we also have another competitor that has entered the arena. They're called Meta X Tech. And they're putting their hat in the ring and they're saying they're going to have a gaming GPU ready for the domestic market by 2025. Now, this could be a really big deal as China's manufacturers to this point, this is a Chinese company, have mostly focused on productivity and business GPUs, things for like artificial intelligence or servers, generally lower powered, not things that could be able to compete with NVIDIA or AMD. However, the sale of GPUs in China represents 40% of the world's entire consumption. So again, if you look at the 30,000 foot view, maybe EVGA is smart here in exiting the GPU market because if they can flood the market with really cheap but powerful cards out there and they can sell 40% of them right there in China where they're being made, well, that's going to make a huge impact for companies like AMD, NVIDIA, and Intel who are going to be finding their GPUs even less profitable than they were before, potentially. So we've had a lot of ups and downs, a lot more coming, I predict. If you're in the market for a GPU, avoid eBay as scalpers and lots of burned out crypto cards are flooding it. But if you are in that market, 
go grab yourself one of these amazing deals right now from a trusted vendor. So for now, my advice is buy, buy, buy. Which it's fun to say because it, before it was hold, hold, hodl, <laughs> hodl, hodl. Yes. It's, or it's, search, search, search and find nothing, nothing, nothing. The fact that you predicted this exactly is, you know, it's it's surprising that they didn't try to, you know, do something about it until it blew up in their face. Basic concept of supply and demand is, is we're just seeing it in a drove of learn your lesson, people. They got so happy counting that money that they just couldn't see what was right in front of them. However, if they were listening to this podcast, they would have known. They would have exactly. known. Exactly. Something else you guys can all trust is Bitwarden, and that's the password manager that we use here at Tux Digital. Bitwarden lets you set up things like a pin to easily access your password manager, as well as additional authentication, such as master passwords, and adding phrases to fingerprint security all to keep your passwords safe. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and businesses to store, share, and sync their sensitive data. Go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started for free. Say you want that premium account. It starts at just $10 per year. With one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, and Duo, Vol Health Reports, TOTP authenticator storage and generation plus priority customer support. Make the smart move like many in the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started for free. If you're like me though, you're going to want to show your appreciation for this awesome open source project and sign up for that premium edition, especially where it starts at just $10 per year. Thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of Hardware Addicts. All right, Wendy, take us into the camera corner and tell us about some Nikon fun. We haven't talked about Nikon in a positive light anyways in a long time. Are they doing something good finally? It has been a while since we've talked about Nikon, and this isn't actually anything new in their cameras. I thought it was very interesting, some of their history that they brought with them to the photography show of 2022. Nikon and NASA have, have been working together since 1971 they have built cameras specifically for them to take on apollo missions one of the ones they had there went up with the apollo 15 crew these are really beefy cameras but they are amazingly sharp it's not your standard full frame or the size of a piece of film these are medium format cameras, which is a little bit deceiving in the term of that, but medium format is really quite large and it helps capture a lot more detail on that print, on that image. An amazing work and it's really cool to see the way that these cameras looked and you'd have to think about designing something that you could use while in a spacesuit and how much that would affect them being able to push the buttons to wind different things. And there was no auto mode at the time of, especially these first cameras that were going up with NASA. So you're going to have to manipulate the different settings of that camera while wearing a spacesuit. So it's definitely bulkier than your standard camera, but a really, really cool piece of history. Imagine that. Imagine having those big, fat fingered gloves astronaut gloves on and trying to do something like wind a camera film <laughs> like or change the setting <laughs> yes oh my gosh that would take some serious dexterity so it makes sense they had to make this custom and i think mad props to nikon i mean what an amazing accomplishment to be used by nasa uh, for those space missions out there which is really cool and i love that they brought their old tech there because you kind of forget the magic and history of cameras and how far They've come. I mean, now nobody needs professional photography. We can all do it on our phone. But back then, I'm teasing. I'm teasing, Wendy. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it is amazing how far cameras have come. They really have come a long way. And it's not the end of the innovation from Nikon. Nikon has been a big player for many years. And they had one of the first underwater SLR cameras. The one that they brought here was released in 1992. They didn't make very many lenses for it. I think it was just a total of four, 
but these lenses were so good that they are still coveted by people that do underwater photography and have found ways to adapt them to newer camera bodies. Absolutely amazing. This one looks a little bit like a toy in its plasticky, chunky feel, but it is nothing but pure photography awesomeness for underwater. Yeah, I would love to get my hands on something like this just to play with, especially when I go diving and those type of things. And what's really cool about this is that it was made in ni- or released in 1992, which is the same year I was born. <laughs> no, it wasn't. You were not what? born in 92. Are you kidding me? I, you guys are killing my story. All right, what else did they bring, Wendy? <laughs> so the last one that they had that is very noteworthy was a camera that they put out in 1984. This is one of their best-selling models, but the extra special thing It is a 24 gold-plated SLR camera. If you bought it back then, it would be 500,000 yen or nearly $3,500 in today's money. Though when we're talking about the gold plating on this camera body, that would actually raise the actual price of what it's worth currently. Very, very expensive camera. It was the exact same model as their popular one, just plated in gold. They did not make very many of these, though. So if you wanted to go look for one now, you'd have to be a little bit of a miner digging for one. Well, what's interesting about this is it makes me think this was the iPhone of 1984. You know, today you have to carry around an iPhone to show, you know, you're you're flexing. You, You got an iPhone. You've got the green bubble. But back then, it was all about having the Nikon, gold-plated Nikon that you could walk around. And uh, it was Starbucks. Starbucks wasn't back then. Whatever coffee shop was around back then uh, to show off and write your screenplays and everything, you put your gold-plated Nikon on the table. Coffee was reasonably priced. and Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Good point. So, Wendy, out of these three cameras they brought here, if you had the opportunity to take one home, which one would you want? Oh, I I wouldn't get to do much with underwater. I think I would love to have the one that was built for space. Well, if you can't do much with the underwater, what are you going to do with the one in space? Build a rocket well, you and could still fly use up there? the one that was meant for space to take some amazing large format pictures. All right, fair lived. enough. Plus, you wouldn't have to worry about, you know, the not being able to manipulate the controls because you're going to be Big enough to mess with because I deal with these fat fingers all the time that have nothing to do with wearing gloves. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Well, that's it. Our sixty-eight plus one episode of Hardware Addicts is a wrap. (laughs) That's not how that works. That's not how counting works. I had to do that to keep you from laughing like a child. I laughed Michael. anyway. I, it doesn't even the only Six- problem is you brought the attention to it so much worse. Like it's so much yeah. bigger issue because of the way you did it instead of just saying 69. Wendy, <laughs> now we I have go. to edit that out. Thanks for listening to the show that brings you your bi-weekly tech fix. If you're not all lit up on tech yet, then be sure to check out all the great content on the Tux Digital Network. Head to TuxDigital.com to check out all the amazing podcasts and YouTube partners available. There is so much there to fill your brains with. Remember, there's no such thing as too much hardware. Learn, build, innovate, and grow. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you next time for another 24-karat gold-plated episode of Hardware Addicts, where the awesomeness is always in stock. 